think we can get started. So, um, talk a little with a few folks ahead of time. It sounds like there are a lot of folks have a lot of content authors to manage, and so uh, looks like picked a good talk. So, who am I, and uh, and why should you care? Why should you listen to me? So, um, I work for a company called Blue Spark. We're a full service digital agency. We do a lot of digital strategy, user experience design, uh, Drupal development uh, kind of stuff. So. And me, I'm uh, the managing director, and my background is in user experience design and uh, experience strategy. I'd, I'd spend the last bit of my career focusing on how you merge kind of business requirements, business analysis, uh, the mission, mission or vision of an organization with kind of a great user experience and, and thinking even, even bigger than that and beyond digital in terms of service design, which kind of led us to, led me to thinking about operations of a website you know how do you how do you create something that your staff and your team can use to actually engage your audience and drive your mission or, or your vision forward deliver results on that worked with a variety of clients in various capacities from from Red Hat uh, Indiana University UCLA library and, and all of these are managing you know a few uh, from 50 to a few hundred content authors. Um, Red Hat's even managing a, a large community. They have community contributors for content. So it's, it's really fascinating the different challenges that these organizations are facing. Um, so before I start, uh, probably wondering why I have a quote of Carl Sagan, um, I, I kind of want to lay a few like of my philosophical ideas. We don't have to go all the way back to the Big Bang, but I do want to lay a little bit of groundwork about where I'm coming from and where some of these tips might be coming from. Um, first off, I'll talk a little bit about who this talk is for. Um, I like to think in terms of the content steward, the person that is responsible for gathering all the people and, and making sure they're producing quality content. And, and this content steward serves various roles. Certainly editor being chief among them, but project manager, particularly for bigger pieces of content that need to get published. Uh, writer, at times, uh, therapist, certainly. Uh, but ultimately, it's the content steward's job to bribe, cajole, convince people to publish content for the website. Um, and, and not just content, because everybody, anybody can write content, and anybody can write content that they think is good. But what you're after is content that engages. Uh, your audience, I'm just going to read it, audience, uh, content that engages your audience and delivers results on the vision for the website and the mission of your organization. Because otherwise, what's the point in having a website if it's not delivering results? So what makes for good con uh, stewardship? What makes for good stewardship? And I think there's just six, six traits here, and I'm going to quickly go over them because I don't have a lot of time, and I want to make sure I get to the meat um, of the presentation. Uh, but good stewardship is educating, is teaching your content authors what it means to create good content and, and coaching them and guiding them and, and really bringing them along. It's championing the idea that your website is there to engage your audience. And it's, it's getting out there and, and helping people see why they should be doing it. Uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but it's encouraging people to publish. It's, you know, Writing content is a tough thing. We've all stared at the blank page and been overwhelmed by that. So it's getting out there, being the therapist, being the cheerleader, and getting them to publish. It's supporting them, right, whenever they have questions, whenever they're struggling. Um, it's celebrating the success, not just with your content writers, but also with their managers. And it's listening to the challenges they're facing and helping them kind of, and helping break down those obstacles. So in my mind, these are the, the qualities of, of good stewardship that you, whether you're managing a small number of authors, a large number of authors, whether it's just yourself writing for the website, these are, these are things that you're doing. Um, common challenges that we face whenever we are, particularly whenever we're stewarding content for, for big websites, um, is this often is not your only job. This is just one thing that you're responsible for, and it's easy for that to get set aside in, in, in favor of other responsibilities that you have. Um, I'm guilty of the second one. Uh, people like to have written. You don't want to write, you want to have written. If that makes sense, right? 
Um, there's a publish it and forget it mentality. So we put everything out there, we put it out there, and we, we, we're on to the next thing. How is it performing? How can we have made it better? What can we do to improve it? It's, a, it's the web. It's not a printed material. Um, you can go back and change it if things aren't clear, if you get feedback on it. Um, another big thing, particularly, I think, with when you're dealing with hundreds of pe people who aren't writers by trade, uh, even, especially if they think they're good writers, uh, writing by, uh, by its nature is a personal thing. We think it's an expression of ourself. And so any kind of criticism of the writing is often taken as a criticism of them. And that's, all, that's very difficult to overcome. And it can be very emotional to have those conversations with them. Um, I was going to ask what other challenges we have, but um, I thought I was going to have closer to 40 minutes, but I only have 30, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, but I'd love to hear other challenges that you guys might be facing in your organization if any of those weren't covered afterwards. Uh, so, but this brings us to um, the topic for today's talk, which I want to give you 10 tips for managing a multitude of content creators. Um, these are tips, this is advice, things that I've seen, that I've observed. Uh, in working with the organizations that I've worked with. Um, there's no silver bullets, there's no, no magic formula. It all takes time and effort and energy and, and, and persistence. So number one is easy reference material, right? Um, a style guide serves as a great reference for when you should how, how they should write, what, they, uh, what grade level of writing they should be targeting. Um, and you don't have to write these from scratch. You don't have to have your own. There are lots of really great style guides out there. Um, MailChimp has a great style guide that you can say, look, MailChimp is the one that's our starting point. Here's the link. Go read that, and it, then you can add to it. If you have an intranet or a wiki, you can add to it. Uh, worksheets. There are some really great worksheets to break down, like, okay, what's the purpose of the article that I'm writing? Um, my son has one of these, he's a fifth grader, and it's like, man, we should use this for writing online. You start with the purpose, you know, what are your four or five key ideas, and you use that as the basis for writing your article, and you stick to the key ideas. Um, the content life cycle. So one of the things we mentioned in the challenges is the publish it and forget it mentality. Well, if we think about the content life cycle from, you know, the idea to the draft, the reviewing, you know, how we add metadata, what kind of metadata we should add, the publication of it, promotion, follow-up, and in some cases, the retiring of the content. And we set expectations for each of the stages of the life cycle. Um, that's going to be clear to your, to your writers what's expected of them. And then checklists. Checklists are just great. Now, does anybody here question checklists and why checklists are awesome? Do I need to go into that? So just, you know, a clear, like a 10-point checklist whenever they're going through it. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Great, you're done. Publish it, move on. But it's not enough to have the material. It's not enough to even have written it in a, in a way that's easy for your, for your content authors to understand. Make it uh, easily accessible. Remove all barriers to publication. So, so make all your reference material, your style guides, your worksheets, your checklist, make all that, like, when I go to publish, it's right there. Give it to them in PDF format. It's in their email. It's in Dropbox. It's in, it's in printed right there on their desk. Like they can't turn around without hitting the reference material somehow, some way. Um, uh, yeah, they they will, they will, no doubt. But but it's your job to try to try to prevent that. Um, let's see, uh, streamlined workflows. This is one of the challenges too. I think particularly whenever we're designing, we think about the challenges and issues and trying to put in constraints in terms of, well, let's try to make sure that we're actually publishing good content and a lot of that makes sense, but we gotta be careful not to put too many constraints in place, otherwise that discourages people from writing the content that needs to get published. This content still needs to get published. We would like it to be of a certain quality, but as long as it's getting published, we can iterate to that quality. So think about how we streamline our workflows and even think about working outside the content management system, um, have people start writing in Google Docs or some kind of shared content authoring system that's not where, not, it's not like a WYSIWYG editor that feels as dry as Drupal's UI. Sorry, Drupal developers, um, it's kind of bad. But the great thing about Google Docs too is you can comment, you can make, suggest changes, you, there's, you have so much, it's, a, it's a full on word processor. 
uh, and, and you can, it's a much richer environment for providing feedback. Um, focused UI, if you do have to stay inside Drupal, I think I was talking to some, somebody over here, like if you have a content author and their job is writing, strip away everything else except the, just the features that they need. Uh, and Drupal 8 the, will, will allow your developers to, to change the admin UI based on the developer's role and the, uh, based on the, the, the role of the author. So strongly recommend you're working with your dev team to, to get them to do that. And it'll, don't expect it to work the first time. You're going to probably, oh, I, I want to do this. What happened to that field or what happened to that feature? It's going to be a little back and forth to get it just right. But, but if you can streamline and you can simplify stuff, that would be a good step for your, for your authors. Another big challenge for writing, uh, it's not just the writing, it's if this is a promoted piece or something you typically have imagery associated with it, that's another big roadblock for a lot of folks is they don't like, how do you select good imagery? Um, so where do I go to find it? What's approved, what's not approved? So making sure they have access, they know where, where media sources they can go to, whether it's a videos or what's your policy on publishing YouTube videos? Stuff like that, right? Like, like, and make sure it's all centralized in one place with easy links. Um, and how do you cite images? So if I, if I do use um, a Creative Commons image, how do I get make sure that that's cited properly? Never stop training. So we all think about onboarding. We think about that initial training step where we want people to come in there and we're gonna sit and we're gonna talk with them or we're gonna review it. We walk through and maybe that's an hour, maybe it's 90 minutes. And they'll create, great, you know everything. Maybe, <laughs> probably not. Um, so do the initial onboarding with the new folks. Then meet with them regularly. Have weekly office hours. If you have a Slack or some kind of chat application, be available periodically for that. Um, if, if there are some folks that need extra help and they have questions about how to do stuff, if you've ever used Calendly or where you can block off like a little bit of time for, you know, so that people can schedule 15, 20 minute conversations with you where they can say, hey, I have this problem or I have this challenge. I just want to sit down and brainstorm with you a little bit so you can help me think through this. And you can actually, you know, cut, all, get some prob cut some problems off at the pass before they develop into bigger issues. Um, and then I strongly suggest monthly refresher trainings. Um, and, and kind of sample agenda here where get people to share their appreciations. You know, the more people feel appreciated for the work that they're doing, the more likely they are to continue doing it and to engage with it even more. Uh, celebrate successes. Um, review published content, what was good about it, what wasn't so great, what they could have done better. But prepare people ahead of time. Like I said, you know, the, the uh, writing is a personal thing. You don't want to spring that on somebody. You want to make sure they're comfortable with it. Uh, then an open Q&A just to give folks a chance to just ask whatever questions they have. And then uh, but don't forget to promote the training. Get it out there. Let people know. Make people aware of it. Just don't like schedule it. People put it on people's calendars and expect them to show up. That's not going to happen. That's just, you know, just you, you want to get out there. You want to make sure they're showing up. Do what you need to do to get people to show up. Um, Next one, and I'm sorry, I'm really going through a lot of this stuff pretty quickly. Um, but know your staff. Know the capabilities of your staff. What, what are they good at? What are they not good at? Don't ask if you're working on promoting, you've got an event coming up, and you, you know, don't ask somebody, okay, can you go out and select some good photos for this for somebody who just doesn't have the eye for it? You know, so know, know what their capabilities are. And be on the lookout. So you might know that this person has a, a tendency to write more academic than what you would like, be on the lookout for that and, and be ready. Okay, you know they're publishing some content this week. Once it goes up, be ready to give them that feedback or, or try to get out ahead of that. Schedule some time to sit down and review it with them. So just think about your staff and think about what they're doing and what their strengths and their weaknesses are and, and try to compensate as much as you can for their weaknesses. Um, recruit assistance. So you're, you're going to have people who are really good at what they do, and maybe not initially, but they develop that over time. Can you get some folks to you know, like maybe sit in on some office hours with you or where they're reviewing some content and taking that off your plate? Um, now, these folks are doing your favors, so maybe you, you know, bring them coffee periodically or something because they're making your life a little bit easier. But can you find people, especially if it's just a, a one-person show, that that's, it's just you being the, the, as the content steward, can you find other people on your team, that the other authors who are, who are good at their jobs and, and kind of uh, use them as a 
uh, to help train the rest of the staff. Touched on this a minute ago, but celebrate the successes. Celebrate what's, what's working. Point that out. It's so easy, particularly as, as an editor, when you're looking at a piece of content to focus, you know, focus on, get the red pen out and strike through everything and it's like, okay, this is what we need to improve. Or, you know, okay, the traffic to this article that we published that we needed X, uh, X percent of traffic for, it didn't hit it. It's so easy to focus on the, on the negative and then that just wears people down and discourages them from writing more content. Celebrate stuff, always find stuff to, to celebrate. Even, you know, even if you're, you gotta show them an article that's completely red, Find the one or two pieces in there that, that's good that you can compliment them on. You can always find something good to compliment people on. And that's, you, you got to do that. You got to take the time uh, to do that and, and show appreciation. Because um, like you, this is not their only job, right? In fact, this is, you know, maybe, maybe it's 25 to 50% of your job to kind of be the content steward. For them, it might be 5 or 10% of their job to write the content for the website. So, so be appreciative and, and, and encouraging. Of that. Um, another really, the, uh, it, I was just about to flip, but I, I want to focus on the fourth point too. The more specific you can be in your celebration or your appreciation, the better it is received. Be as specific as you can. I do uh, art with uh, the kids at home. I volunteer and kind of teach art with with fourth graders. And it's in a very rewarding experience. But every like. Like, you can tell the difference when you say, oh, that looks great, versus, wow, I really like the, the shape of that, that circle there. You've got a really interesting curve to it, and, they're, they're, you know, it's very different. The eyes light up, and, and we do that as well. So the more specific you can be in your compliments, in your encouragement, the better received it will be. Um, share results, right? This is kind of a continuation of celebrate, but show people the results that matter to them. So not everybody's going to care about the traffic to a web page. In fact, some pages are probably only going to receive four or five hits, and that's really all that it should get. Um, so, so what are the results? Like, what oh, you know, maybe you got some feedback from a user that says, "I was looking for this information, and this was clear, and you know, I got this, and this was really great. Really appreciate that that this content was out there on the website." Um, whether it's an anecdote like that, whether it's, you know, whether the, it's maybe some people do respond well to metrics where they want to see, okay, how much traffic is my, did my event page get because we're waiting to, see, you know, I want to see how many people are going to show up. Uh, but share the results, share, pass that information on to, on to your authors. Ideally, huh, we're not there yet, but I would love to see a Drupal dashboard where whenever I'm signed in to my and looking at my content, I can actually see like metrics associated with what's going on, whether it's okay traffic or, or maybe there's a sign up form on there, like how many people signed up after they visited. So like be able to identify what the key metrics are for that piece of content and have that show up in my dashboard. So I get as the author, get immediate validation that my content is successful or it's not. And I can go in there and tweak it and fix it. Right. Uh, but that faster feedback would be really, really helpful. Automate as much as you can, right? Uh, so, so data architecture is one of the great things about Drupal is just how much metadata you can associate with a piece of content from tags to categories to dates, all this stuff. And so if you can have, you know, uh, you know okay, we know that this event is at this location uh, and it's in this category and we know that, okay, obviously it should show on that, up on that location's calendar, but maybe it should, based on the tags, it shows up, but it's promoted in other places as well. So we can use data architectures just to get it out there and get it promoted very easily so we don't have to do a lot of that by hand. Um, use readable.com, sitebeam.net. These are really great resources. They're subscription services, but they're really great resources that you can run stuff through. And the nice thing about something like readable is that you're taking some of the sting out of the feedback. You're not, it's not so personal. It's like, look, we set a target readability score of, of fifth grade, sixth grade, so those are reasonable. Um, and, and Mr. Professor, yours is a, a college level uh, wording and, and phrasing here, so we need to kind of bring that down. And this is just what it is. You just not, I'm, I'm not criticizing your use of semicolons. I think they're brilliant, but <laughs> this is what we have, you know. <laughs> You're on to me. Um, 
And then just review the results. Like, bring this up. When you go to your weekly meetings with folks, like, pull, like hey, look, our site readability score is here, right? Or whenever you're reviewing a piece of content, talk about what the readability score is. Um, but don't just give the feedback to your writers, your authors. Give it to their managers, too. Help them get that promotion. Help them get that raise, right? Like, they're going to appreciate you so much more, appreciate the feedback, if they hear it from their manager, if their manager goes, you know, I was talking to Jane the other day, and Jane says, you're doing great. You're killing it with the content. I, I'm so happy to hear that, right? That, yeah, who doesn't want to hear that from their boss? So, so, so manage up. Manage to their boss, but not just their boss. Manage to the executives. Tell, uh, create reports. I mean, uh, one of the big challenges that if I'm an executive or a, or a manager, you go to Google Analytics, and what do you see? I, I don't know what I'm looking at. I can't make heads or tells of this. So create a simple one-page report that you can explain very clearly, look, this is how our website is being successful and helping drive our mission forward, helping our vision for the website. This is how we are being successful with the website. And here it is, very simple, very plain. And everybody across the organization who's working on the website gets that praise, so we'll benefit from that. Um, the other value to that too is as you start to feel overworked and overwhelmed, which you will, uh, and you do, I know you do, um, that starts to lay the groundwork for getting some help Right? Like you're showing the value, you're showing what's going on, you're showing why this is working and why should, they should continue to invest in this. And then eventually like, okay, you love this, this is great, I'm overwhelmed. Can I get some help please? Part-time, contract, whatever. Speaking of overwhelming, take a break. Take a break. Small breaks throughout the day. When you go to lunch, turn your phone off. There's virtually no emergency that's, that, that can't just wait a little bit. Um, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. This is going to be a lot of work to get all this stuff done, so you can't just, you can't just go, 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 go. Um, another, another, this was something that I saw this as developer time versus manager time, and this is really helpful for me at some point, so I kind of tweaked it a little bit. So editor time versus uh, focus time. So there's stuff that you need to do outside the scope of, of managing all these authors. There's also editing and other stuff you need to do. So let's separate that. Let's say, okay, you know, a couple hours in the mornings, I have my office hours and a couple hours I'm gonna be reviewing stuff and editing stuff and then in the afternoons it's all blocked off for me to focus to do other stuff. Try to create blocks of time so that you can, when you need to focus you can, when you're interruptible you are. Uh, because you can't, like, if you have stuff you need to focus on, you can't be interruptible. It's just, you're not, it's never going to get done. You're going to go mad doing it. Um, another thing to think about stuff, a way to think about things is, is this important or is it urgent? Right? And, and 90, 100% of the time, the urgent is going to trump the important. So unless you make time, block time, set aside time, make sure the time is blocked and you're focusing, you're going to work on the important work that you have to do instead of the people knocking on your door, hey, can you help me edit this or fix this or do whatever, uh, your important work is never going to get done. And that important work might be selecting which style guide you want to use, um, figuring out how, how, dealing with other kinds of content issues or figuring, working with the developers to integrate with the readable API or, or streamline the UI, you know, all that stuff has to get done, but you're busy, and unless you block off time for it, it's not. So to recap, um, I won't go through them again because I've got a minute and a half, but I'm sure my slides will be available. But 10 tips, the key takeaway is big. You can't do this alone. It's a big site, lots of content. You're not going to be able to do this alone. You need competent, empowered staff that's gonna, that can help you, but to get there, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. It's, it could, for some folks, it could be a few months. For other folks, it could be a few years. But it's just going to take consistent, persistent effort. Um, I was hoping we'd have time, a little more time for questions, but, uh, but I'm here. So if you want to ask questions, we can. Um, that's it. Go ahead. So the question is, how often do you see um, uh, like a core web team that's responsible for developing all the content versus where it's kind of more distributed? Um, and it really depends on the size of the organization. Like if you have, uh, 
you know, smaller organizations, say less of than 100 people or closer to 50, like you're gonna, you might see a, a smaller web team that's responsible for it, uh, rather than kind of having it distributed. It also depends on how much content the organization is producing, is responsible for producing. Like if it's a very singular, this is, we just have this little bit of content, it's gonna be more controlled by marketing. Uh, whereas say uh, government and you know governments and libraries and just just sheer volume of content that they're producing you know the policies the all that stuff is just it can't be controlled by a central organization so I think a big part of that is just the size of the organization. That is a great, that is a great question, and and really there isn't a there, like there's no silver bullets uh, for the first part of the question, um, you know how do you get buy-in from your ma from the managers, particularly the managers of the content authors? Um, I'd sit down and listen to what concerns they might have. You know, is the person overworked already, and and they can't, you know, they're worried about how much time they're committing to it. They feel like you know that's not necessarily important. Like, what are their concerns? Listen to them. Um, there's a book called People Skills that really talks about active listening. So, and, and I find that that kind of process, like it helps people feel heard. And if they feel heard, they, and, and then, then you turn that around and get them to help you come up with solutions. It's like, okay, look, I hear you. These are all problems, but this is what I need. Help me figure out. So, so help this. So you're enlisting their help to help come up with a solution. And if they're helping you come up with a solution, they have ownership by buying into the solution. And that's, you know you still might get pushed back and they still might forget that they did that, in which case, I mean, it's still a management. They're still going back, hey, you remember we talked about that. This is what you said. It's following up an email. Okay, we had that conversation. Here were your concerns and here was the outcome for that. And, you know, just getting them to agree, getting them to agree and encourage publicly too, where they have other people that, that they've committed to is also helpful. Another great book to read in addition to the people skills for active listening is Influence. And just the different ways you can rely on influence to, to in, well, and in, get the, to influence their, what they're doing, what they're saying. So, and what was the second half of the question? Uh, managing the tension between you as the sort of the expert on writing content and then as the expert on the content itself. Yeah. So that's great. Great question. Uh, I think there's two parts to it. One is goals. What are the goals of the content and is the content achieving that goals? And, and that, that's where too, like we talked about, what's the readability score that you're after? Like what, what, you know, what are the guidelines that you're following and be able to, to be able to point to those guidelines, to be able to point to that score where it's objective. So as much as possible, making it objective, taking it out of you to be being critical. I mean, certainly, you know, if the style guide says you need to use serial commas and they're not using serial commas, and if you're not using serial commas, what's wrong with you? Just, just saying. But right, what's the, you know, so what does the style guide say? So make it more objective. The other thing too, that I think, hands down, let, get, get users in front of the content. Get, get them recordings of users trying to understand, what does this content mean? So whenever you need to do this, you know, where the, is the answer on this page? And they're reading through pages and pages of text. And they're like, I, no, it's not here. And so it's not me offering the user experience. Exactly. So, so get it out of you. You're, as much as possible, you're not the one providing that feedback. It's, well, this is the style guide. This is what it says. This is the user. This is what they're saying. This is your readability score. This is, so make it more objective, because if it's coming from you, it's subjective. Yeah. Other questions? I think we're, we're at time. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.